And I'll be talking about uh, another energy source, if you will, of uh, providing ablation of prostate tissue. This is vascular targeted photodynamic therapy. Um, I'll start with a one of two questions. So which of the following is true about focal therapy in general? Uh, focal therapy for prostate cancer is FDA approved, and I'll let you read the other three and you can vote. Okay, so a smattering of things. Uh, actually, answer three is correct, and we'll go through that. Uh, most folks getting focal therapy are continent, and very few actually require surgical procedures. So uh, three is correct. Let's go to the next one, please. And uh, this is specifically for uh, vascular targeted photodynamic therapy. And uh, again, you can read the responses and choose accordingly. Okay, okay so again, a, a smattering of responses. Actually, the uh, correct answer is, is number two. So we'll go through this and uh, obviously a lot to learn. This is a new technology, so we'll go through all of this. So vascular targeted photodynamic therapy basically uses a chromophore, which is based on chlorophyll, actually. It's called padeloporphin. I'll just call it drug from now on. And it's specifically activated by a, a specific wavelength of, of light, uh, laser-delivered light. And that activates this compound locally, and it basically results in vascular occlusion. Um, so this is not a strategy that generates heat or cold, and that's one of the proposed advantages of uh, vascular targeted therapy is there's not collateral damage. Basically, you can destroy the lesion you're planning on destroying without having to worry about other surrounding tissues such as the neurovascular bundle or the urethra or other important structures from being damaged. It's basically done like any other brachytherapy template-based strategy. So there's a transrectal ultrasound probe uh, placed uh, um, in the rectum to visualize the prostate. There's a brachytherapy template that's utilized to guide cannula or fibers into the prostate, and you map out an area um, that you wish to ablate. Um, there's certainly guidance strategies, and depending upon the volume of tissue one wants to destroy the location of that tissue, a computer algorithm will tell you where to place the fibers. The fibers do have different lengths um, in terms of how much light energy they will deliver, so you can set out a treatment plan to very specifically target an area within the prostate that will then be destroyed. The light-enhancing element, the podophylline, whatever it's called, um, is uh, the, the agent, is given about 10 minutes before you uh, place the light on. So it's a, a relatively quick procedure in terms of uh, getting the patient uh, treated. These are the various uh, types of fibers that can be used. And at least from a science standpoint, you want what's called the light density index to be greater than one. And that's determined by the volume of the tissue that you want to ablate, and then the sum of the fibers in terms of the length of energy that you will be delivering over that period of time. And again, there's a software program that tells you where to place these fibers and the length of the individual fibers based on the treatment plan. So this is a two-dimensional image of the ultrasound, but basically it shows you where the fibers need to be placed, thus how many fibers, and then the length of those fibers, and that gives you a formula that allows you to calculate if you'll destroy that tissue appropriately. This is flipped from the uh, cartoon on the other image, but this was a, a left-sided ablation, and you can see that you can ablate large areas of the prostate with this technology. The Resultant biopsies basically show necrosis of the tissue. Um, the time-lapse studies of this um, demonstrate that it is a, a, a vascular-generated uh, necrosis. There's really no heat changes um, that are associated with this technology. And as with all of these ablative strategies, where it's, whether it's cryotherapy, electroporation, you can throw in radiation therapy, they all work in terms of destroying tissue. Um, so some of the nuances of, well, do you use one versus the other versus the other, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish and what you have available to you. But they all kill tissue. Um, that's, uh, that's for sure. I'm going to spend most of the time during this presentation talking about a, a recently published uh, phase three study. If Dr. Gamella is still in the audience, he actually commented on this article um, in Urology Times. 
uh, but it was basically looking at patients who we would otherwise consider candidates for active surveillance. So you can argue whether that's the best patient population to study, um, but this was the, the study um, that was performed. It was done in Europe. It was led by Mark Emberton, who is certainly a, a big proponent not only of MRI, but also MRI-guided treatment strategies. Fairly low-risk patients when you look at the patient population that was studied. So basically, no one had um, any Gleason grade four, certainly no Gleason grade five in their biopsy. It was small volumes of Gleason score six, all with PSAs under 10, uh, very few with actual palpable lesions, um, and then from a, a technical standpoint, just a limit on the prostate size. Exclusion was basically anybody that didn't meet the eligibility criteria, prior treatment for their prostate, um, whether it be a TURP, and no one can be on any type of hormonal type uh, therapy. Uh, the primary endpoints, there were co-primary endpoints. Uh, the first was an absence of uh, a positive biopsy at the 24-month uh, uh, mark, and the other was a time to treatment failure. The time to treatment failure is basically all of, or defining treatment failure based on all of these outcomes. So again, at 24 months, you wouldn't expect much metastasis or death or progression to T3, but there's a PSA endpoint and primarily progression to higher Gleason score. Um, so those were the co-primary endpoints. The secondary endpoints, they did do biopsies at 12 months. Patients that had a positive biopsy at 12 months that were in the original treatment arm could be retreated. It actually ended up only being about 5% of the patients, but retreatment was allowed, and then they looked at uh, PSA levels, MRI findings, et cetera. Um, a well-balanced study, nothing uh, dramatic, a 200 or so patients in each arm. Most were Caucasian. Uh, body mass index is pretty much irrelevant. But uh, because this is a low-risk patient population, so patients that were otherwise candidates for active surveillance. The vast majority, 85 plus percent, were clinical T1Cs. Most had modest PSA elevations in the five to six range. Uh, the numbers of positive biopsies based on the eligibility criteria was only about two, and uh, most had, uh, by definition, Gleason six or less. There were a few that were still called Gleason grade twos, but essentially all of them were Gleason six, and uh, three quarters of them had a unilateral lateral disease only. If patients had bilateral disease, both uh, lobes of the prostate were treated. So the co-primary endpoints, as I mentioned, uh, the first was a negative biopsy at 24 months. And if one looks at the outcomes, basically the 2CAD is the treatment arm uh, versus the surveillance arm. So far more patients in the treatment study, about half of them actually had a, a negative prostate biopsy compared to the surveillance group where only a, a small minority had a negative biopsy. And then the second primary endpoint was this progression endpoint. Each of these were listed out. Most of the people that progressed were based on uh, of course, biopsy features, very few based on PSA or, or clinical score progression, as I mentioned. None were going to develop metastasis or death um, within a, a two-year time frame. But most had progression to a Gleason 3 plus 4, and some had uh, more than three biopsies positive. But regardless of these individual characteristics, it all favored patients that uh, were treated with the photodynamic therapy. So basically, fewer patients had either a positive biopsy at 24 months or met one of these definitions of patient progression. If one looks at, uh, um, again, the other aspect of this was how long did it take these patients to progress. Again, a delay in progression, even in those patients who did progress, based on treatment, whether they were just active surveillance um, versus the photodynamic therapy. So in essence, setting the clock back, if you will, in those patients treated with the photodynamic therapy, even though this was a low-risk patient population. This curve is a bit strange. It's based on the biopsies, of course, at 12 and 24 months. That's why there's these steep drop-offs. But basically, the patient population that received the photodynamic therapy were less likely to progress because they were less likely to meet either of the co-primary endpoints. This did uh, reach statistical significance, of course, and far few patients 
as we'll see in this, developed higher risk disease. So in terms of the biopsy endpoint, if you looked at the patients who progressed to Gleason 7, which would be in many centers an indication that active surveillance had failed, about twice the number of patients that were just under active surveillance relative to the patients who had received treatment. Very few patients went on to 4 plus 3 um, rather than 3 plus 4, but again, it favored the treatment arm. One criticism of this study is there's a fairly high progression rate at just two years of active surveillance for what is a relatively low-risk population. A single core of Gleason 6 that at two years had almost half the population now having a Gleason score of 7, that's a little bit quirky, but it was a randomized trial. Pathology was reviewed, so the numbers are the numbers, but relative to other active surveillance populations with similar low-risk patients, that is a pretty high number, again, just pointing that out. If you look at the initiation of radical treatment, so patients who, again, were active surveillance patients, some were treated with a, a standard active surveillance protocol, the others treated with the photodynamic therapy, about 30% of the patients in just the active surveillance arm ended up being treated, only about 6% of the photodynamic therapy patients, again, at two years. One can argue, again, that a 30% treatment rate after just two years of active surveillance in a relatively low-risk population is a pretty high rate of treatment. I think most would have about a 5 to 10% treatment rate. Um, but again, a randomized population, and their numbers are the numbers. If one looks at some functional outcomes, uh, basically the patients did very well with what is a focal therapy, and that's the advantage of doing a focal treatment rather than a whole gland treatment. Um, if you look at the active surveillance population, they basically stayed at their baseline functionality throughout the two years of the study. There was a transient worsening of urinary function in those patients that were treated uh, with the uh, photodynamic therapy, but basically they then improved over time probably reduction in gland volume as a result of tissue being destroyed. If one looks at sexual function, there was a worsening of sexual function. Again, the active surveillance population had about a, a, a slight decline, age-related, of course, they didn't have any treatment. The patients that were treated with the photodynamic therapy had an initial decline. They had some improvement, but again, relative to the active surveillance population, there is a little bit of decline, but not dramatically. If one looks at the safety profile, certainly with the treatment as compared to active surveillance, patients had more urinary dysfunction. These are the ones that reached essentially clinical significance and then ejaculatory failure, erectile dysfunction, et cetera. Again, active surveillance patients, of course, receiving nothing is not going to have a significant impact on your quality of life. Receiving something, even if it's a focal something, uh, does at least transiently have a negative effect. If one looks at the uh, more severe, compare these two columns, there's basically very little difference between the active surveillance arm and the treatment arm in terms of grade three or higher uh, side effects. So again, a relatively safe treatment, some transient changes in uh, quality of life, uh, more significant with erectile function than uh, urinary function, and most importantly, um, improvement in oncologic outcomes. So the authors concluded from this study that basically it's a first trial, of course. There was a substantial reduction in progression, primarily by preventing higher grade cancers. Many more patients converted to a negative biopsy if they received treatment. Uh, there was a substantial reduction in the progressing to um, aggressive or whole gland therapy, 30 versus 6 percent, and then the safety and the quality of life profiles were at least acceptable. So at least from the, the photodynamic uh, therapy, you know, whether this was the right treatment population, you know, should we be focusing on active surveillance patients, one can argue, but at least it is a randomized phase three study that at least will show in selected patients on active surveillance, perhaps the higher volume uh, patients, that uh, perhaps this type of treatment may be of some benefit. Now, just switching gears a little bit, this is just basic science laboratory. It comes out of Jonathan Coleman's lab, 
who has done most, if not all, of the work on the photodynamic therapy at, at Memorial, what he did was he treated the, these LINCAP tumors, so these prostate cancer tumors generated in mice, and what he saw was that when they looked at, you know, the genetic stuff that goes on in these things, that many of the androgen response elements were actually stimulated or increased with photodynamic therapy. And what that resulted in is that um, one could hypothesize if some androgen deprivation therapy was utilized, that that may improve outcome. That since photodynamic therapy enhanced a survival pathway, by blocking that survival pathway in this androgen-regulated genes, that perhaps the outcomes would be improved. And that's basically what he showed in a, a relatively small study with mice. But again, looking at the control versus those that received hormonal therapy alone, those that received photodynamic therapy alone versus the combination, again, the combination arm of combining the androgen deprivation therapy utilized before the mice were treated with the photodynamic therapy, there was much larger reduction in um, tumor volume compared to either of the treatment arms or the control arms. So again, suggesting that combination therapy and moving forward, short-term hormonal therapy followed by the photodynamic therapy may actually be an enhancement of the overall treatment pathway. So there certainly is compensatory upregulation of androgen receptor signaling, and that by blocking that pathway, you actually improve outcomes. So in summary, I think focal therapy in general effectively ablates prostate tissue. It doesn't matter what energy source you use, you can kill the tissue. I think how much tissue we kill, how we target it, and how we follow these patients to have a meaningful outcome, those are the questions um, that re remain. Certainly focal therapy has better quality of life outcomes than whole gland strategies and which patient population will best be served by focal therapy, what are the appropriate endpoints, I think that's what needs further uh, discussion and uh, has yet to be determined. So with that, I'll finish my presentation.